All right. Okay, here we are. Let's finish up chapter 11, and then we will actually be ready for the Thanksgiving holiday. Or I will. You can watch this whenever you want. Just try to make sure it's before next Monday because we'll be moving on to DNA then. Okay, so we left off with this part of the recording that gram-negative bacteria have um, different structures on the outside. We've mentioned gram-positive bacteria. Remember, the gram stain will bind to the pentaglycine crosslinks that are on the outside of the gram-positive bacteria's outer armor. And uh, of course, bacterial membranes are very important to us. If we can somehow mess them up, we can somehow destroy the bacteria. So gram-negative bacteria um, have a distinctive membrane of their own. And it's just important to point out that uh, all of these bacteria tend to follow this pattern. They have phospholipids on the inner leaflet, on the green on the bottom here. But then above that, they have a special lipid called lipid A. And that lipid is actually attached covalently to some kind of core molecule. Usually it's sugars, but it can be kind of anything they throw onto it. And then they add more sugars, which is the O antigen. This follows the general rule, if you're outside, you're glycosylated in some way. A sugary outside um, makes everything more soluble, more stable, and actually it shields it from immune attack as well. Gram-positive bacteria, here's a very different kind of artwork about it, but if you look at this, this is the uh, pneumococcal cell wall. And so it's gram-positive and it's flipped over. So you have the membrane in yellow, sort of in the middle, and below it you have the cell wall and peptidoglycan layers. You see how they're definitely cross-linked. And so you have a very strong, sturdy structure. Lysozyme is able to cut this green structure apart. But again, it's not that different from gram-negative. Uh, it follows the same kind of trend. So all of these things have sugary outsides, but they have the lipid membrane inside. And if we can breach that wall, we have an antibiotic technique. So the, we've talked a lot about the fluidity of the membrane, and I want to give you one important experiment that is the way that we found this kind of thing. One of the ways we found out that membranes need to be fluid is that um, we did an experiment where we literally zapped them with lasers, and then we saw what happened after that. This led to the idea that membranes must be a fluid mosaic, is what they talked about. The mosaic part is all the other stuff that's in the membrane, like receptors and maybe even sphingolipid rafts and things like that. But the main thing is it's kind of like chocolate, that in the sense of you have this fluid, oily, a uh, very mobile layer around all these little islands of chunks of receptors and things like that that are floating in it. That is the main idea to have, that it's really more liquid than solid for the majority of the membrane, and that's why they call it the fluid mosaic model. It's a lot of motion, but it's limited to only two dimensions, and it's sort of uh, two-dimensional across motion rather than up and down from bilayer to bilayer motion. One of the ways that they show that most cells have a very liquid outer membrane is they did this experiment that's shown over here on the right. When you have a cell and you put a fluorescent probe on it that will attach to the head group, you basically coat the entire cell with a red molecule that's covalently bound to the membrane lipids. And so when you look at the cell under a microscope, it looks red. The thing about fluorescent labels is they will glow very brightly when they're hit with normal light. If you hit them with intense light, you'll burn them out and you'll do something called bleaching them. And so what you'll do is you'll actually, if you zap a laser at the part that you're looking at, you get something like what's shown on the third level down. You get a big white spot exactly where the laser hit. But what they did is they kept looking at the white spot after they zapped it with the laser. And what they would see is that over time, sometimes sooner, sometimes uh, a little more slowly, but definitely eventually when you have the cells at room temperature, the white color will be filled in with red color diffusing in from the other parts of the membrane that have not been zapped. And so that's what you have. You have this, um, this is one of the investigations that let people see, oh, the membrane really is more like a dissolved fluid than it is like a set-in-place protein solid kind of structure. 
And you can measure the rate and you can see just how fast the membrane can dissolve. And this led to this model where the membranes are primarily fluid. In fact, if you have a membrane get too cold or get too solid, it stops working well. If you have the membrane looking like this picture on top, where it's really tightly packed, it's more like you know the beef fat, it's more like the solid lard that stays solid at room temperature. And it just doesn't work. The cell can actually die under some of these conditions. What, for a cell to be alive, it needs to be heated up enough to where it is more of a disordered liquid. So membranes need a certain amount of disorder in order to flow, in order to live. This kind of disorder can be provided by heating up the membrane and or by introducing points of unsaturation. Remember that those make the membrane more liquid. So the, the membrane can actually be tuned to how liquid it is by how many of the fatty acid chains have unsaturated points in them. And the cell can control that. So this is a, a nice little figure from, uh, it might be kind of small, so you might want to pause and zoom in on it. But um, it shows, it's from a paper that shows how membrane composition will affect membrane fluidity. And if you see all these things over here, on the far left you have all the factors that we've talked about. If you have unsaturated, you have more fluid. Uh, if you have a thin membrane, it's going to have fewer contacts between carbons, and it's going to be more fluid. If you have a thicker membrane, and if you have sterols in that pack really well with the other ones, you're going to end up with a more solid, less fluid membrane. And so it's all a balance, and we can give you one of these factors, and you can think it through. Is it going to make the membrane more fluid or less fluid? And there's a particular point that the membranes need to have a certain amount of fluidity. Uh, if you have uh, things, you can have things like you can have little curvatures in the membrane. That's sort of the advanced, advanced beyond the textbook that we have for you. But if you look at the different membranes on the, uh, on the right side of this figure, on the top they're going to have the ER membrane and on the bottom they're going to have the plasma membrane. And the important thing to see about these, these can even be slightly different thicknesses. They can be different fluidities. They have different jobs to do, and their composition will help determine that they are the right amount of fluid to do that job. For example, you can see that the plasma membrane is actually thicker. You have a protein that goes across those will be 25 amino acids thick, whereas the ER, a protein that goes across that membrane, will be only 20 amino acids thick. Uh, usually we're talking about the plasma membranes, by the way, um, but if we're talking about eukaryotes, we can also talk about the other membranes, and they have their own compositions, their own functions, and that's how it all works. So the fact that membranes need to be liquid is part of the explanation for why trans fats are bad for you. It turns out that trans fats, because they reduce the fluidity of the membrane, they make the membranes work less well. And so this is used to explain why saturated fats are good for you, unsaturated, bad as well, because that also goes with the fluidity explanation. There's a, a very common experiment. You feed rats olive oil and their blood pressure goes down. It appears to be good for them. And so in this context, they fed rats different fatty acids. They fed them the natural cis oleic acid. Then they fed them the trans oleic acid. And then they fed them soybean oil as a control, which has no oleic acid. And it turns out that in this context, the cis oleic acid rats had lower blood pressure. The trans oleic acid did not. And they looked at the membranes and they saw that the membranes of the, I believe it's the plasma membranes of the rats, they had more liquid membranes when they had the cis oleic acid, which makes sense. It has the elbow right, which makes it more liquid. The trans, exactly the same chemical composition, but different structure that makes it more solid. They looked at why exactly this would be, and they found out that, for instance, the cells are more receptive to signaling as a result. The protein receptors work better with a liquid membrane. Um, the signals that reduce blood pressure will be more recepted, more received well by the, prote by the um, proteins that receive the, the things, and the membranes are part of how that signal is transmitted. So this is an interesting sort of complex thing. The liquid membrane is important to sending signals.
if you don't have the right signals, you don't end up being able to regulate blood pressure and ions and things like that the right way. This is another experiment that is uh, sort of it's simpler. It has to do with E. coli. But with E. coli, you can actually grow them at different temperatures, and you can see what the composition of their membrane is. And it turns out that grown at different temperatures, the E. coli will make different, um, different kinds of fatty acids in its membrane, which will make it more fluid at the lower temperatures. So if you look at uh, 10 degrees versus 40 degrees, I think, oh, I thought I had a little animation here, but I'll just explain it to you. The important thing is to look at the bottom number on this. It's the ratio of unsaturated to saturated. And so at 10 degrees, you have more of the unsaturated uh, fatty acids, which are the uh, top two rows. And at, um, actually, I said that backwards, sorry. At 10 degrees, you have more of the uh, unsaturated, which is the colon 1 ones, which are the third and fourth row. You see how you have more of those at 10 degrees. That's because you need the points of unsaturation to be able to keep the membrane fluid at the colder temperature. At the warmer temperature, you've got the, the thermal energy that's able to keep the membrane fluid. The E. coli, then, they don't make as many of the saturated it's possible that it could be a little bit too fluid if they made as many of the unsaturated little kinks. If they do the saturated amino acid, uh, fatty acids, sorry, I'm a protein chemist, I keep saying amino acids, but you know I mean fatty acids, right? The uh, saturated ones are overproduced in this case, and you can see the exact ratio um, of which ones are overproduced. They need to make certain number of them. They also need to be 16 thick on average to make the membrane be the right thickness. So you see that you have uh, the differences between the two of them uh, result in a membrane that's the correct thickness and the correct fluidity. Because the membrane is a liquid, if you like label one uh, protein, you will see that it will move around. Like if you, if you label it and track it with a microscope, you'll see that it will sort of dissolve in two dimensions in different ways. Another interesting thing that you'll see, you'll see that it will sort of stay in certain regions. So like it will dissolve, but it will only dissolve in a particular area. That's shown in this particular um, example where they show you start observing a protein that's been labeled and it's in the membrane and it moves all around in the purple area and then it jumps to the blue area and it moves all around the blue area, then it jumps to the green area, moves around in that, then it jumps in the yellow area, moves around in that. You kind of have these four distinct areas where it's like they have different yards. And this led scientists to say there's some kind of fence in the membrane. What could be acting as this fence to keep the protein in a certain domain is what they called it. And, but it's a fence that the protein can hop over occasionally with enough energy it can hop over the fence. And they, they decided that that fence is actually on the inside of the protein. Um, you have these uh, cytoskeletal proteins on the inside of the membrane. And they sh sort of show you on this figure right here, you see the different little colored domains where the protein can move around. The fences are the cytoskeleton proteins. It's actually, they show its um, spectrum in this case. The important thing is it's cytoskeleton. And it creates these little regions, and the protein will dissolve around in it, and then occasionally it'll be able to sort of hop over the fence. Remember that the protein is extending through the um, bilayer in many cases, and it just looks like the fence is sort of holding the protein in one certain domain. Uh, but it can jump over from time to time and move around. So the membrane is not perfectly fluid, in a sense, because it has these microdomains that are defined by the cytoskeleton. There are some other proteins that they looked at, like this glycophorin protein that's shown on the top of this right here. Glycophorin doesn't move at all relative to the domains, uh, and it looks like it's actually tied to the cytoskeleton. And you can have a protein that's like that as well. You can have uh, the chloride bicarbonate exchange proteins. Those are also tied down to the cytoskeleton. What's really important is not the names of the proteins that are tied down, just to know that depending on whether it is actually bound to the cytoskeleton or not, you will see the different patterns of diffusion on the cell surface.
because membranes are fluid, they can act like fluids and they can dissolve into each other. And this leads to a lot of cool cell biology. Again, beyond the realm of this class, but this leads to all the cool things you can see cells doing. You can see the Golgi complex buds out vesicles, and then the vesicles dissolve in the plasma membrane and release their contents. All of that has to do with lipids, and the reason why membranes can do this is because they are essentially two-dimensional liquids. Endocytosis happens through a membrane sort of forming from the plasma membrane. Viruses dissolve in the membrane. Some viruses have membranes, and they fuse with the membrane itself. This is possible because the membrane is non-covalently bound. You have fatty acids that are joined together by van der Waals contacts and hydrophobic forces, but it's rather easy to sort of push one membrane into another and have them dissolve. Fusion of sperm and egg, small vacuoles in plants, and even cell division where you have two cells sort of pulling away from each other. Remember that those are all more liquid than solid processes, and those all have to do with the fact that membranes are non-covalent assemblies of macromolecules. Oh, oh, and the other thing is, if you poke a hole in a membrane, it will actually seal itself up, just like a liquid will pour itself over if you sort of poke a hole in it or dribble it out. You join two drops of liquid together, they will dissolve in each other. In the same way, if you make a hole in the membrane, it'll be self-sealing. Membranes are pretty amazing materials, if you think about it. So here are some examples of stuff in the literature that shows membranes working like this. This is um, like the lipid metabolism. Different parts of metabolism are probably affected by membrane uh, fluidity. This is one example where they show a non-fluid membrane on the left, and you can see that's all saturated, non-fluid. And then if you have a fluid membrane in the middle, you have a different kind of fluidity but because you have unsaturated chains. And then if you introduce sterols, you change the fluidity yet again. It increases the packing and increases the thickness of the membrane in this case. That all affects how lipid metabolism works. And in fact, me lipid metabolism involves making more fatty acids and making ones that are saturated or unsaturated according to the needs of the cell. So there's an interesting connection here between Biochem 2 topics, which is the lipid, um, the, how you make more lipids that are saturated or unsaturated, and the way membranes behave, the way the whole cell behaves as a result. This is one really cool example of that. This is where scientists actually um, changed the saturation of a membrane and it changed the way the whole cell worked. What they did is they introduced this protein called FabB. And if you look at what FabB does, it's right up here in the middle of this. FabB basically, uh, it takes the um, membrane and it, it actually will add a ketone group onto it. What that will do is that will introduce a point where it becomes, uh, it'll introduce more unsaturated fatty acids into the membrane. So you end up with phospholipids like what's shown right here in the middle. You end up with phospholipids with more points of unsaturation, which means they're more fluid. By introducing this gene into E. coli and turning it on and off, the scientists were able to control the fluidity of the E. coli membranes. And so they have this figure right here. Uh, they added arabinose, which turned on the gene, and depending on whether the gene was turned on or not, they ended up with more or less acyl chains that were unsaturated. And remember that the more unsaturated you have, the higher you are on this graph, the more fluid your membrane is. So they started with that, and then they did a bunch of experiments. One of the experiments that they did is they measured how respiration works. Remember that respiration is taking electrons from some electron source and passing them to oxygen. You get energy from this, and the cell, you know, is able to do all its energy things. It's able to build itself, thrive, you know, it's able to live as a basis of breathing with oxygen in this sense, passing electrons to oxygen. Uh, the, the bacteria have lots of different ways they can get electrons from different molecules. All the electrons go to oxygen. The one other thing to realize about this is the different ways to get oxygen, uh, to get electrons off of different molecules, 
the different ways require different proteins. They all pass the electrons to this Q molecule that's in the center. It's shown it's a quinone electron carrier. It's shown above my head right there. And what it shows, what it does is it, um, they all pass electrons to oxygen through the membrane. This molecule dissolves in the membrane. It carries the electrons through the membrane. And what they were testing, they tested to see, well, okay, does the cell care about how fluid the membranes are? It turns out the cell cares a lot. If you turn up and down the fluidity of the membrane, then what happens is you get more energy, more respiration energy. The cell is able to move more electrons to oxygen. In all three cases, all four cases really, that they show above my head right here, whether you give it electrons through succinate, uh, whether you give it through um, glycolysis, I think it's glucose that they're doing there. I think it's glucose that they're showing, or they, they can give it through um, pyruvate as well. All of those different ways of giving it electrons, it doesn't matter. In every case, you end up with more respiration if you have more fluid membranes. And they say that's because all of the electrons have to go through the membrane because they have to go through this Q molecule that's shown in the upper left part of this. So the more fluid the membrane, the higher the respiration rate, no matter how the electrons are supplied. I think that's a really cool thing because it shows that there is a physical process, physical diffusion process, and that might be limiting on all of life. Membranes might limit respiration because you have to dissolve through the membrane the electrons have to go through the membrane. And if you have a membrane that's too solid, the whole cell will be able to breathe less, will be able to pass electrons to oxygen less. This is kind of complex, but it's the kind of thing that I want you to focus on. There's only a couple more topics I want to talk about, and most of them have to do with the proteins in the membrane. There's different ways you can look at an amino acid sequence and tell something about how it goes through the membrane. For one thing, you can just see, are there a lot of hydrophobic residues in a row? Well, that's probably the membrane-bound portion. Are there a lot of hydrophilic residues? Well, that's probably soluble, and it's probably either outside the, the membrane or inside the cell, outside the membrane in that sense. And so if you have a protein sequence, you can ask the question of where is the hydrophobic region and um, the hydrophobic part is probably the part where it's stuck into the cell membrane. If you, the other thing that you can do, remember we have glycosylation sites, and we actually know what the glycosylation enzymes like to work with. We can look for those signals, those patterns in the amino acid sequence. And if we find those patterns in the protein, if we find a lot of those patterns, we can say, oh, this part of the protein is probably outside the cell because that's where the sugars are. By following these rules, we can actually figure out from the sequence where we think the protein is embedded in the membrane and what parts of the protein are outside versus inside. Another test we can do is we can take a cell expressing that protein and we can throw a protease at it. The proteases will be able to cleave the protein only in its extracellular regions the proteases are not able to cross the membrane to get at the part of the protein that's inside. So by combining these three kinds of information, hydrophobic residues, glycosylation sites, and where proteases cleave, we can often figure out a lot about how the protein sits in the membrane. And we can figure out things like, is the amino terminus on the outside or is the amino terminus on the inside? Questions like that will give us information. So notice how the hydrophobicity of the membrane crossing helix is enough. If you can see this, I know it's also in your textbook if you can look at it there. It's got all hydrophobic amino acids in a row. And so if those form an alpha helix, we know the dimensions of the alpha helix. We know the width of the membrane. And so we can see if there's a compatibility there. If we have an alpha helix that's all hydrophobic and it's just as long as the membrane is, we can make a good guess that is probably a membrane anchoring region. So many membrane proteins will cross the whole membrane. We call those integral proteins, membrane proteins, and they'll have these hydrophobic anchors in them. 
Um, but there are also proteins that are so, sort of more associated with the outside of the membrane. They're associated with the head groups of the membrane. These are more loosely bound, and we call these peripheral proteins because they are easy to remove from the membrane. So an experiment you can do to tell if a protein is integral or peripheral is that you can throw different chemicals at it and see if it's easy to remove it or not. If just a little change in pH, or if you add a chelating agent, which will chelate all of the metals like calcium that might be helping to stick the protein to the membrane, or if you add just carbonate, which will change the pH as well. And if the protein falls off relatively easily with one of these things, it's peripheral. If it doesn't fall off, you're thinking it might be integral. The only way to remove an integral protein is to actually disrupt the membrane itself by adding strong detergent, which will actually be like a detergent like SDS that's strong enough to actually uh, solubilize the protein to act like a fake membrane and to cover up the hydrophobic parts of the protein. That's a lot harder than just changing pH and kicking the peripheral protein off. So you have, um, you have these terms. There's also the amphitropic protein, which is usually a peripheral type of protein. I'm just giving you it because it has it on this slide right here. But that's a term that means a protein that can go on and off of the membrane. Very clearly, that is a type of peripheral protein that we're talking about here. The final type of protein is a type of protein that's sort of in between the two. It is um, embedded in the membrane, but it is embedded through a uh, prosthetic group. So it's embedded through a uh, molecule, especially a lipid itself, that is actually covalently attached to the protein. This is not the same kind of integral protein. We would call this an anchored protein. Um, and then the question, this would be sort of a third type between integral, which is the type with the yellow hydrophobic region, peripheral, which is the type, a blue type that goes on and off. And then we have the anchored protein, which is um, sort of between integral and peripheral. Here's a nexin, and you can see this is a peripheral protein. It binds to lipid head groups, and so it binds to the charges. This is actually, um, I believe this is choline. You can look at the head groups, and they're blue. Nitrogen, it's going to be positively charged, and so you'll expect the protein to bind to those positive charges through some negative charges of its own. But another thing the protein can do is it can sometimes bind through ions like calcium. Calcium also is positively charged, so you expect negative charges or hydrogen bonding groups that will attach to the calcium to be able to mediate this. So this is a peripheral membrane protein. Um, to get rid of this, you uh, changing the pH would probably kick an exon off. Uh, adding a chelating agent like EDTA, that's a molecule that will bind up the calcium. And if the calcium is not there, the interaction will be weakened and the protein very possibly would fall off in that case as well. The case where you can anchor the protein is you can actually have some enzymes that do post-translational modifications where they attach lipids to the protein. There's a large diversity of these. Uh, the one I want you to know, and I don't want you to know the structure of these, I just, just want you to know that there are different types of these. Some types are for the inner leaflet and some types are for the outer leaflet. One type that's important for the outer leaflet is the GPI anchor. I say this because I'm interested in the immune system and a lot of immune proteins are GPI anchored. The GPI is just a special kind of lipid anchor that actually covalently attaches a um, lipid, a double fatty acid glycolipid to the protein itself. This will mean that the protein will be sort of anchored and it will stay in the, um, in the lipid pretty strongly, more strongly than a peripheral protein, that's for sure. There are some other types that involve single fatty acid chains and those are on the inside. The names of these are not as important though. The other thing I want you to see, and I'm sorry my head might block some of this, so I'm going to try to explain it to you in words. There are six types of integral membrane proteins. They all have minor differences. Two of them are anchored, and I just told you not to pay too much attention to those. So I want you to pay attention to the four types that are integral, um, and those are the ones I want you to pay attention to.
Uh, let's start from the bottom and work our way up. Type 5 and type 3 are both, um, they have multi-subunits. So they have, um, they have multiple crossings of the membrane. And the type 5 just has multiple crossings that are in separate chains. Type 3 has multiple crossings all in one chain. And um, that's the difference. It's, these are relatively simple, so that's why I want you to know them. The other thing is type 1 and type 2 proteins. And notice, by the way, inside is on the top and outside is on the bottom in this. So I want you to study this, but I want you to know the difference between type 1 and type 2 proteins. Again, this was important for me to know as an immunologist working with these proteins. So I'm going to pass that knowledge on to you. I'm going to say it's important for you to know that type 1 proteins have the N-terminus on the outside. Type 2 proteins have the C-terminus on the outside. So right side up, you can think of that as type 1. Right side up has the N-terminus where we always start on the outside of the protein. And type 2 is flipped over like that. Um, so just get to know that. That's the kind of thing I just want you to study, and I might ask a question about it on the test. So for instance, if you know these, you can look at bacterial rhodopsin. You see one chain, seven helices that are embedded in the membrane. Okay, so that must be a type 3 integral membrane protein. And bacterial rhodopsin is an incredibly important protein, and that's one of the reasons why it's important for you to know what type 3 means. This actually is, uh, it's important that bacterial rhodopsin is a membrane protein because it actually opens a door and it lets protons cross the membrane in response to light hitting it. If you notice, rhodopsin has retinal in it and it actually will, um, is the protein that twists. There's a lot more to talk about this in the biochem to come. So for right now, we'll just say it's a membrane protein. Isn't that cool? We'll be talking about membranes when we talk about how rhodopsin works. And uh, so in your eye, it's actually a membrane protein that is important in your eye. If you look at eye cells, by the way, you see large disks of protein embedded, uh, large disks of membrane that has protein in it, embedded in the cell. And this is why, because rhodopsin itself is a membrane protein. Lots of cool stuff to tell you, but it will have to wait until we talk about chapter 12 in Biochem 3. But bacteria rhodopsin, you could tell that it's a type 3 protein, actually, from uh, not even having its structure, crystal structure. Uh, you can tell by looking at its primary sequence. Because you can do things like you can chart out the hydropathy, which is a computer tool. It will add up the hydrophobic stretches, and it will say, hey, I've got seven stretches that are hydrophobic, and all of them are about the right width to be an alpha helix crossing the membrane. Oh, I think that bacteria rhodopsin must be a type 3 protein. And it must be a membrane protein, because it's so hydrophobic. So if you look at this, I'm going to pose this question to you. What type of protein is this? So you know it's not type 3. It's not type 5, because this is all, you know, there's no indication that there's multiple chains here. Um, so it must be type 1 or type 2. But uh, it's only got one membrane crossing region. I would have to give you more information, though, for you to figure out, is it type 1 or type 2? The only thing you can say is it looks like it has a larger domain on the N-terminus, and that's probably a signaling domain. If it's an extracellular signaling protein, I would guess that it's probably type 1 with the N-terminus on the outside. But that is only a guess. If you look at the pattern of residues, you can see something beyond just whether it's hydrophobic and crossing the membrane or not. It seems that to, uh, in, to interact with the head groups, you actually have some residues. You have a particular kind of residue. Look at this figure right now and try to figure out what the blanks are covering up. Um, you have membrane proteins, and you're showing how they're sitting in the membrane. You have um, uncharged residues are gray. Tryptophans are red, tyrosines are orange, and charged residues are blue. So looking at that, you can see that you have big gray stretches where it's embedded in the membrane. But more than that, you can see that there's a lot of red and orange around where the head groups are. It has tryptophan and tyrosine, which are kind of hydrophobic, but not completely hydrophobic, able to interact both with the hydrophobic part of the membrane 
but also with the hydrophilic part of the membrane. So you have charged residues outside the membrane, and by the way, by here I'm using outside to be outside the membrane. Tyrosine and tryptophan at the water-lipid interface to interact well with water, lipid, and with the head groups. Uncharged residues are inside the membrane. Those all the gray stripes that you can see that are compatible with the yellow part of the membrane. So this means that you have to include the, mem the proteins. The proteins are sort of in a two-dimensional thing. So you can imagine that if you pull on the membranes, the, the proteins, they'll be able to flex a little bit, but they won't come out of the membrane because they are, you know, they are integral and it's hard to remove them. It would be easy, however, to move them side to side. You can imagine them moving side to side. And there's more in this video if you want to see a picture of it moving the protein side to side. Hard to move up and down, but still a little flexible. Easy to move side to side and diffuse in the membrane. This is something that just came out, but it turns out that the way that the protein interacts with the lipids, if it interacts with them really well, it just sort of sits there. But it's possible that the protein could actually have a purpose for interacting with the lipids next to it poorly. If it interacts with them poorly and it has sort of what they call a hydrophobic mismatch, so the lipids are just kind of distorted. They don't pack very well next to the protein. If you have a protein like that, the protein will actually diffuse really quickly through the membrane because it won't be content to stay in the same place. They call it like an icebreaker that actually sort of distorts the membrane and flexes it and then it able, is able to move around. In a sense, it's sort of elbowing aside the lipids a little bit easier than the uh, protein that just sits there and just sort of passively diffuses. And there are some proteins that actually use this to be able to move more quickly around the cell. Scientists observed this, they didn't know why, and they found that it actually has a physical reason behind it. The physical reason is the protein does not fit well into the membrane and as a result, it diffuses faster. I just think that's kind of cool. It's more liquid in a sense because it's the same kind of thing as the unsaturated lipids, but they don't fit as well into the membrane. And so the membrane itself becomes more fluid. This is a protein not fitting as well into the membrane and the membrane around the protein becoming more fluid as a result. Membranes are just really cool, I think. So remember, the, uh, the only last thing is that you can have different kinds of lipids in the membrane, and some of them will self-associate. We so showed you those sphingolipids that they'll self-associate. One of the reasons why they self-associate is that they actually are a different thickness. And you can actually have these little islands of thick sphingolipids floating around in the membrane. Membranes are just this really complex and cool assembly. And I want you to see how all this complexity comes about from a few chemical rules. This is a side view in your book's view of a um, lipid island, okay? So they call this a microdomain of lipids. And if you have thick sphingolipids or just longer fatty acid chains in general, you'll end up with this thicker sort of domain. You might have different patterns of cholesterol dissolving in it, depending on the way it interacts. And the really cool thing is the GPI anchor is actually something that fits well into this thicker sort of lipid domain. So you have what are called lipid rafts or microdomains that are enriched in sphingolipids, GPI anchored proteins, and cholesterol. And these probably are important to signaling. You imagine if these immune proteins are important to their GPI length and they're important to immune signaling, if we understand how these rafts move, we might understand how the immune system functions. And remember that the immune system doesn't just defend you against bacteria, it defends you against cancer as well. So all this, all that's to say, this membrane chemistry stuff that doesn't seem like, it seems like it's just carbons interacting, right? But it actually might affect how the immune system and cancer work. Um, so I want to think about those things. And that's one of my favorite things when chemistry shows up in strange places. It's showing up in a strange place here. The dynamic things can even be like whirlpools in the fluid of the membrane. Here's a paper about how microdomains, because they're thicker, they can sort of tilt. And because they tilt in a liquid environment, they can form spirals. And you can have um, microdomains that when you heat them up, they start to spin 
And so you have these amazing sort of effects that's what's going on. We're just getting the idea of what's going on with these. Incredible complexity just from mixing different fatty acid chains together in the context of phospholipids. So um, life's biochemistry is really cool. So I hope that you find that interesting, you know. Another way in which you might find it interesting is if you've ever done electroporation, what you're doing is you're actually adding electric charge and ripping holes in the membrane. Now that we have simulations of what a membrane looks like, we have simulations of what it would be like to rip these electrical holes in the membrane. And the idea is that this is what it looks like. You apply the electrical charge and then you move from left to right and you have these holes that appear in the membrane. How big do the holes get? How long do they last? Well, that's what the computer simulation is trying to ask. But if you can rip holes in the membrane with charge, you can also rip holes in the membrane with protein structure, and you can have a protein that actually has a big hole in it. We've already talked about ion transport. Well, how big can you make a hole in the membrane? Well, you can actually make it pretty big. You can make a, a beta barrel that sits in the membrane, and if you look at the red part right there, that's an entire protein fitting inside the pore of the beta barrel that's there. Um, these are like the single sheet beta, um, beta sheets that we were talking about. It's just wrapped around on itself. And in fact, I think they're related to the topic of that paper that we, that we had in part two, in uh, test two. Here's some pictures of some different kinds of beta barrels that form big holes in the membrane. And uh, the FEPA is the one that I showed you. It's all the way on the left. But you can see that you have other kinds of por um, porin proteins is what these are called. And if you look right above my head, is the alpha hemolysin. And that does what it says. Hemo means blood, lysin means breaking. It breaks the blood cells open. And it lyses red blood cells. It is a toxin to your blood because it punches big holes in the membrane. I'm not sure you can see it behind my head, but there's a top view where you have this big hole right in the membrane. And when the toxin is exposed to red blood cells, it's um, they aren't long for this world because it starts to punch holes in the membrane. Osmotic pressure equilibrates. And remember that equilibrium is the enemy of life. Here's how hemolysin works. It actually starts off as a soluble monomer and it has this orange beta hairpin that then unfolds when it gets to a membrane and it polymerizes with other hemolysin molecules to form the beta barrel that makes the big hole. It's heptameric, so that tells you that it needs seven friends to be able, or six friends because it itself is there. It needs seven proteins to be able to polymerize and form that big hole. So that's how hemolysin works. I'm not sure what organism makes it. It seems like the kind of thing a nasty bacterium would make. Uh, and when it gets to your red blood cells, it will blow them open. The FEPA protein that we showed, they're doing some models of that. And I think these are really cool. They're modeling how the little protein will fit inside the beta barrel. And they're also modeling, you see all the blue? They're modeling how the water will fit inside it. And it's like this column of water that is going through the protein uh, with the protein as it goes. I just think that's really cool that you can do that in computers, that we know this well enough to look at where the atoms are. The one last thing that you'll see with membrane proteins, many times in protein uh, crystal structures, now that we're getting some of those, you actually see some lipids crystallize along with the protein. So that means that these lipids are really tightly bound. They're probably less liquid and more solid because they're so tightly stuck to the protein. And these are called annular lipids, okay? This is a, um, the FO protein, which is a big protein that has a hole in the middle and it's an integral protein. And you can tell where the membrane's supposed to go because you see the phospholipids that are actually stuck to it. The FO protein, by the way, is on the bottom. On the top, you have sheep aquaporin, which has a hole for water on the inside. But on the outside, you can see where all of the lipids are stuck to it. The carbon chains are yellow. And you can sort of see where the membrane is supposed to go above my head. You can see the, the blue polar head groups to, to those membranes as well. So these annular lipids help us see that there are some tight interactions between the lipid membrane and the proteins. We can even still see it in crystal structures.
this is the very last slide, so you've made it. Um, I want to explain why cardiolipin works. Cardiolipin looks like it's an annular lipid. It looks like it's actually bound to the protein, and I think we've gotten some crystal structures with cardiolipin bound. And remember how cardiolipin is weird because it has a whole nother membrane lipid. It's kind of a covalently bound two for one lipid. The head group, its heads are conjoined, okay? The reason for this is that both of the lipid tails are attached to different proteins, and so it's literally cross-linking the proteins through the annular lipids that are stuck to the proteins. The reason why we know it's important is because it joins together proteins that are part of the mitochondrial energy apparatus. They're part of the electron transport chain. And it looks like these are really important because if these are not present to staple the membrane proteins in place and close to each other, then the mitochondria don't work as well. And cardiolipin, as you might suggest, is important for cardiac function. And it looks like this membrane's function, this biochemistry right here, the two-headed version of it, that allows it to tie proteins together, helps tie your mitochondrial electron transport chain together, helps tie together your energy-getting processes. So here you have a lipid structure that holds your body together. And so, on that note, I think that we've brought this out from the atoms to the entire structure of your cardiac, um, your cardiac mitochondria, and that's where we can stop. So congratulations, we've finished chapter 11. Now please uh, start to work on the homework problems and the foundations. I'm suggesting that you do them in this order with the foundations last this time, because the foundations are sort of open questions and it helps to have the experience of the Leninger homework before moving on to foundations in this case. The last thing I'll mention, there will be a reading quiz for, of chapter eight, so please read chapter eight, do the quiz by Monday. Other than that, enjoy your day off, except for the half hour or so of biochem lecture that I recorded for you. And I look forward to seeing you on Monday where we are going to close out the book by moving on to our last topic, which is nucleic acids and DNA. All right. So I'll see you then. Have a good Thanksgiving. And um, can you believe it's already almost December? I will see you in December, in fact. All right.